Hey, everybody. Uh, so this is going to be my last one on the subject of, of AI. Like maybe way in the future, I'll talk about AI again. Uh, but for now, this is it. This is going to be my last one on the subject. It's just, it's starting to, bore. Oh, like I have food all over my teeth, by the way. Like I can feel it. Uh, and so like, I'm not asking for forgiveness, right? Or trying to excuse myself. I'm just telling you the reason. I'm explaining the reason you see food on my teeth is a meal just happened. Um, but I like AI. Okay, if I were to continue on this subject. I mean, this is my sixth one of these things. There's only so much philosophy I can talk about uh, before I have to start just talking about like the specs of the latest advancements and whatever. Like nothing would bore me to tears as like really open up those lacrimal ducts of boredom, uh, like talking about the details of some, you know, recent technology. Philosophy is really all I care about. And, and, and after six of these essays, I feel like my perspective is pretty well characterized uh, that I don't need to keep doing this. So I'm going to read today's, I'll talk about it a little bit afterwards, sort of sort of squeeze out the, the rest of my, of my thoughts. But Journal 53, Wednesday, May 17th, 2023, Artificial Intelligence and the March of Progress. Hi, everyone. Let's begin with some Buggles lyrics. They took the credit for your second symphony, rewritten by machine on new technology, and now I understand the problems you can see. Uh, maybe it goes a little better than that. Um, later in the same song, pictures came and broke your heart. Put the blame on VCRs. Like, that's in the watch the video, they point to stuff. Uh, that song was included on their 1980 album, The Age of Plastic, which had plenty of other cynical commentary about the repercussions of technology on the established arts. 15,833 days later, today, the same arguments are being made, less catchy, but just as ephemeral as the VCR. I don't mean squabbling over the particulars of the latest developments. That feels obsolete within the hour. I mean bigger topics, like debating the definition of intelligence, the I of AI. This already sounds old-fashioned to me. And I wonder if artificial is the word that misses the mark by a wider margin. It seems everything that existed when we were young is considered natural and normal, while every development that occurred later in life is an aberration of nature. Saxophones, spandex, and bowling balls don't upset our cultural norms because they arrived before we did. To someone born in 2010, the cell phone is as natural as a landline and much more normal. To someone born in 1855, the telephone was an artificial displacement of natural communication. Similarly, no one alive today regards the automobile as alien technology, but the internal combustion engine dis displaced the horse in a hurry and rubbed it in. A Model T had 20 horsepower. Cultural norms seldom change quietly. How do we respond to the change? Same as always, attack the generation responsible is today. Anything they do differently is viewed as a weakening of the species, and perhaps it is, but complaining won't stop it from happening. Every generation, whether by birth or invasion, remakes the world in their own image. And if you're not a part of the succeeding world, your societal role is receding. No culture is immune to displacement or replacement, no matter how wholesome their values. Native Americans know this better than anybody. On a much smaller scale, every generation is supplanted by their heirs. Their values are disregarded, their resources dwindle, their legacies become irrelevant. Invisibility awaited everyone who ignored the internet. Even cultural icons, if they clung to their generation's medium, were forgotten. To quote the Buggles chorus, video killed the radio star. Fast forward the world a couple of generations, and there's a lot more homicide in the records, e.g. YouTube killed the network TV star. Everywhere you look, the ghosts of an earlier generation are loitering over their burial grounds. That used to be a blockbuster, is not a meaningful remark to a member of the streaming class. On a tiny scale, I'm not drawing a pixel for pixel comparison, we see the Native Americanization of essentially every generation that doesn't integrate with the new culture. Every time someone refuses to accept the invading values, e.g. the singers can't sing, their voices are all pitch corrected, 
or this isn't music now, one person can play an instrument, they become boutique and then impoverished. And eventually they join the loitering ghosts. Today, it's AI doing the invading. And eventually we'll be outspeciesed, pushed down a rung. The day is coming, probably soon. Progress is not a sleepy tyrant. It marches and marches and marches, trampling over every culture. No generation has ever escaped replacement, and ours is coming. At that point, no one will squabble over the definition of intelligence. Artificial may still be the pejorative adjective we belittle it with because it changed our status quo and broke our hearts like the VCR. But it'll be as natural as a painting to everyone born tomorrow. You and me, we're waiting in the queue. We're just ghosts on leave. Okay, so that's number 53. And the last one on AI, but here's my last kind of post-journal commentary follow-up outro on, on the subject of AI. A lot of the people I've talked to, I mean, sort of most of them, I haven't talked to everybody, but in my community, most of the people I've talked to live either in a state of denial, right, or a state of dread. And neither of those is a particularly happy place to be. They both destroy our motivation. Uh, in their own way. We, we need some, right? We need, we need some dread to inspire us into action, right? Like everybody runs faster when there's something to run from. The lion is growling or something like that. That'll, our feet will move with a little more haste. Um, and so motivation can come from a, from a controllable amount of dread. And like uh, uh, denial can be kind of helpful, right? We have to purge some distraction, you know, anxiety and panic and, and, and all this stuff. It carries abstraction. We need those like horse blinders to be able to focus. Um, we can call it like constructive ignorance, or, or, or so. like I'm sure you guys can come up with a better uh, term than that. But what we need to do is continue contributing to society, right? We need to continue to be productive, and I think we will because if you look through history, at like much more. Uh, like dire time. I mean, like the most miserable of times with war and and poverty and and I don't know, epidemics and and you go through history at at these just dire, miserable, sort of desperate times. Beautiful art came out of that. and like people wonder like during this really tragic, horrible era, how did such Oh, just heart-rending, wonderful music emerge or paintings or literature or whatever. Just, I don't think people, you know, into the artists and, and, and many of people in the, the workforce, I don't think the tragedy and the oppression and stuff is in the living room, really. It, you know, it's like outside the house and it's, it's globally or it's citywide, it's countrywide, whatever it is, race-wide, you know. Um, but it, it's, it, it's not really in the bedroom always, you know. And, and so we can continue to focus and, 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 and be productive. And I think in the future, um, today is going to be regarded as this era of amazing like art. Okay. Like, how could people, you know, the future's future of people, like, how could, I, you know, people in this computerized, cold and calculated, uh, you know, world of screens and no human interaction, how could they come up with such emotional, beautiful art? Like, easy, right? That, we were, we're, inspiration comes from everywhere. Now, one thing that I don't think is really common and like, this isn't a prediction. This is just what I am thinking now like while I have food on my teeth. And like, by the time that food is gone and like metabolized, I'll be thinking something else. But, but I wonder if sci-fi is going to be sort of, you know, approaching its, you know, is dwindling a little bit. Um, the reason I say that, like, so in a recent journal, I don't remember which one, it, it might've just been my commentary around the journal talking, you know, I was talking about depression. And how, when, when I was being crumpled beneath the weight of it, I could, like, I lost the ability to watch a sad movie. I mean, it was like, I, it was impossible for me to get through. I just couldn't do it. Um, to read a sad book, right? Read like a sad poem or listen to a sad song. I couldn't do any of that stuff. Um, I mean, like every song I listened to needed to be in a major key with uplifting lyrics. Otherwise, like, man, I just 
I couldn't do it. It was, it was impossible for me. And so, um, and, and today I think uh, sci-fi is, it's so real. It's so present. It's, it's like knocking, at, it's not just knocking at your door, right? It's like barged in. Like, I, I don't know, science nonfiction is, is really what it is. And like you lock the door and it pries it open, it kicks it open or whatever. It's in your fridge, eating all your food. It's hitting on your significant other. Like you cannot evict this thing. It is like, it is here to stay. And so I wonder if if our interest in the fictionalization of it is is going to be diminished out back just a little bit. That is that like post-apocalyptic stories. That those are only good at a distance, like at arm's reach. Yeah, we don't, I don't want anything to do with that. Um, but so the last point that I'll make on AI, and then I'll move on to other topics sort of like forever and ever, is this concept that I keep hearing, and I've referenced it a little bit, but the, the democratization of AI, the euphemism of this. Uh, I, I think this deserves a little bit more, a few more sentences. Now, what I'm, what I'm not talking about is the good, right? Oh, the AI, like, okay, medicine, man, it needs AI. How can you do it without AI? Now, I, I'm not a physician, okay? I mean, I have a PhD in a health sciences field and, and I teach graduate level courses in physiology and epidemiology and stuff. So I have, I have some understanding of how a body works, right? And how that, the, the statistics of probability and, 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 you know, diagnosis or, or, or the spread of disease. Like I have some understanding of that. And I was a patient at the Mayo Clinic, okay? The Minnesota campus, like the home base, like the best hospital in the world. Or, um, so I have experience, I was there for like a week or eight days or something. I have a ton of experience as a patient, you know, not just there, but I mean, that's like, you know, let's talk about the top hospitals. Medicine today is medieval. It's really, honestly, it's not much better than that. Um, I mean, the best places in the world are two steps past bloodletting. I mean, we're really poor. Uh, we can do better. How can we do better? Well, revolutionize medicine with AI. I think that's probable. That's not just possible. I think it's almost inevitable. Um, law is another one, right? In, in law, the sort of equitable distribution of legal representation, that's a necessity in, in a in a system that is, you know, kind of progressive or civil or just or whatever. You know, like it, can, it can't just be what kind of legal representation can you afford? Oh, not much. Sorry, you're, you're screwed. Right. You can't like, oh, the, the the ludicrously wealthy can just do whatever the hell they want with impunity. Like that. I mean, look at case law. And, and we have sort of a history of this. And I think AI could help fix uh some of this. And and I mean, like when medicine and law and, and stuff like this, that these would be um advancements to civilization. Like good luck comparing to that Romans, you know, uh, anything the Romans did, you know, like good luck's nothing compared to compared to this. But so what I'm talking about is. The democratization of every use of AI, that I think is really bad. This is this is where I'm saying, like, it becomes a euphemism. I don't think anybody actually wants, the, well, like, obviously, like, criminals do. But, okay, so let me put this. I've been I've, I've a little bit disparaging to sci-fi. So, so let me talk about this in, like, sci-fi terms. Let's come up with a premise for science fiction, meaning, like, not quite scientifically plausible, and so it's fiction. Um, let's say researchers develop some technology that like can blow up the sun. Okay. You know how like an opera singer, they get the resonant frequency of the glass, you, know, you hit the right pitch loud enough, whatever, and like it shatters. Let's say some technology exists, is developed that can like hit the, like the resonant frequency of the core of the sun or, or something. And then like you can download it on your iPhone 22 and it's 99 cents for the app in like $20, $40 and like you hit play and like aim it up at the sky, the orientation of the you know planet and sun. So you know, wait a few minutes, like like there goes the solar system, right? Uh, this, we would continue to democratize. We would develop it as fast as possible. Like if in real life we, we discovered this technology and like, you know, again, it's like fantasy fiction because like you, know, you bore it through space without, you know, losing the, without well, really degrading it. But you get what I'm saying. We would develop this as fast as we can. It would be a race. Microsoft, you know, like Google and whatever third party, um, some Elon Musk thing, would be developing this as fast as they possibly could and, and then democratizing it so that like 10 minutes before Jupiter is whisked away into nothingness, uh, all of civilization would acknowledge who the genius was who, you know, came up with 
<laughs> that concept. And so, and, and so like this idea of, oh, democratize it, that is the like mother and father of euphemisms. Um, now, having said all of that, I think now is the time we need to be producing art. Now, what better time than now to produce works of fiction, uh, music, composition, you know, artistic, every medium of art, what better time could we possibly have? What, what, what time do we need to connect with each other to, to sort of integrate our community and sort of have these emotional relationships than now, right? So like, go start your project. Like now you gotta do it. Now, okay, so I've heard that this is like the very last point I'll make and then I'll sort of stop my Zoom call. Um, but I've, I've heard people say things like, you know, I have this passion project I've been meaning to start, but I'm just going to wait until technology is just a bit more permissive because I think I'll finish it faster. Yeah, if I start now, it's going to take forever to finish it. I'm just going to wait until I can really, you know, the, the brambles are cleared from the path and I can, like, that's... Like that doesn't make any sense. Like once upon a time, people used to always tell me, like, oh no, don't leave now. You know, I have to go do a commute somewhere. Like, oh no, don't leave now. Traffic. Or you you'll get there sooner if you leave later. That's not how time works. That's not, that's not, that's never been possible on any commute ever in any circumstances. So um now, right? Go do art now. Because <laughs> the world needs it and you're capable. And, and I think that's what our capacities should uh, be put to. Okay, that's it for AI ever, forever and ever. Um, and I hope the rest of your life is free from it. For, for, I hope it's not free from it. I, I hope all the medicine and law and everything benefits you in so many wonderful ways. Um, okay, bye everybody.